uh, diversity, not only in terms of nationality, but diversity in terms of education, <coughs> diversity in terms of experience, and diversity, of course, in terms of uh, gendered and racial positionalities before um, labor markets, before education. So it's vastly different to create a set of opportunities where certain young male refugees are able to get hold of, perhaps, if they can do a lot of other things. But the people who are often less able to enact these rights are um, either female refugees, asylum seekers, or working class migrants. So the other aspect of diversity is class, something you don't really hear talked about in terms of refugee policy. We run three things, academic tutoring, which we help prepare students for university. Um, out of 45 students, every term, maybe 10 to 15 enter that track. Uh, we prepare them to make BA or MA applications. We teach them English at five different levels from beginners to advanced. And we have training and advocacy courses. These range from careers, how to write a CV, to something, to drama and filmmaking workshops. Part of this thing about Getting people to this intangibility that I'm trying to convey, trying to get people to have a sense of confidence in themselves. Olive Up is Olive University Preparatory Program. We start the inaugural program in January 2017. It's quite small, 9 to 12 students per year. It's an intensive, full time university preparatory program. It's modeled on the Roma Access Program, which I also work with, um, where we basically we intensively tutor students in small groups in a subject of their choice to help them make a BA or MA application. Now, when we started this program, the first question people asked us was, why? Why do we need to spend so much time preparing students, especially for MA applications? Um, for me, this speaks to two things. One thing it speaks to is a different set of expectations of refugees and migrants. Uh, there isn't this, that's a similar expectation for citizens that the university preparatory program for European citizens to get into an MA degree is commonsensical these days. We all know I'm a teacher. I know you need an MA to really get on in life. But the question we had to convince our funders was that it makes sense to educate refugees either for PAs or MA programs. It makes sense to spend time thinking about the qualifications that they have brought with them how they are often under-recognized. You know, there are cases where university uh, qualifications are recognized as high school, they equivalent to high school cases. We have one student coming to Olive Up who was rejected from university in Norway despite having spent two years in Syria and Lebanon studying sociology and English literature. They wanted her to go back to grade nine. She's a 22-year-old woman. Um, so we come, what we try and do at Olive Up, we prepare them, but we also try and do this advocacy, working together with Menadek and other partners, who I'll mention for a while, to advocate for changes in European, uh, in the way, in the way European Union countries recognize uh, refugee qualifications. There are uh, not conventions, but recommendations. The Lisbon something, sorry, which uh, which calls for a liberal approach to recognizing refugee qualifications. Um, and, we try, and one of the aims of all of that is to advocate for change in that, in, in that way. So we teach them academic English, academic tutoring. It's quite intensive. It's a 10-month program. The first program will be even more intensive. It's a 10-month program compressed into six months. <coughs> so our aims and goals, we question integration. As I said, we question integration. I think it's worth mentioning two points. Integration is ultimately an unequal it assumes a preformed community that people need to fit into. It's an imagined community, of course. Yeah. What it is to perform yourself, or to be Hungarian, or to be Dutch, or to be Norwegian, or whatever. Those of us who are citizens of these countries know that we don't know what that is. Yeah. Communities, of course, form over years through contest and negotiation and conflict. And the way we think about it is that we need to put the word integration to one side and try and think about this process of uh, some type of connection. Some scholars use the word incorporation. Integration is, of course, also it's very linear. It gives a very simple and clear aim 
two policies. You know? What the refugees need, they need integration. Once we process them, we know they're not a threat, they need integration. Which means coming up often with policies of technical, um, technical, what I call technical skills like language, uh, but not paying attention to either the finer points of these technical things like university, rec recognition of university qualifications, or creating a community of support, which is what we try and do at all. Uh, sorry, one more slide. Uh, both our programs are funded by, well, mainly Olive Up is funded by the Erasmus Plus European Commission. It's together with the University of East London, the University of Vienna. So both of these universities will replicate Olive Up and Olive Weekend. European Network Against Racism and Menedek will uh, work with us on the advocacy elements. Um, and Olive Up, sorry, also funded by the Higher Education Support Program of European Society Foundations. But we're always in need of money, so <laughs> keep that. Thank you. Thank you very much. And now, Salome and Philip, uh, do you need a. No, no. Uh, it would be nice to uh, prepare a presentation, especially after the last panel and their speakers, but we didn't because, well. Um, but uh, it's a pity that they left actually, because uh, we are actually going to tell you about uh, how immigration policy in, in Hungary really looks like on a practical level, and not that uh, sort of illuminating illusion that they presented to us. Um, and it's also kind of um, interesting that when it comes to a civil society panel, <coughs> where people have left. Um, Anyways, um, what I want to talk about first is uh, what we are, what Mixo is, then I, will, I want to make a couple of remarks about language and the use of language, and then um, certain actual policies and things that happen in Hungary that fit into uh, um, the discourse that is created. And then I will give the floor to Sandra and try to, to be very brief. So Mixo is a group of political activists um, Mixo was established in 2012, and uh, we are a group of, of, of people uh, that uh, try to um, work. Um, <coughs> the long-term goal is to change the discourse about migration in Hungary, but uh, we, we aim at basically doing this together with refugees and not talking about them. Uh, that's very important for us, and Mixo was established uh, after a protest of 70, around 70 um, uh, Afghan uh, refugees in 2012, and since then we're trying to basically uh, incorporate refugees, Hungarians, and internationals uh, for that cause. Um, we do a lot of things, as you heard, we, we also are part of this uh, on it, on that. Uh, we organize workshops, panel discussions, demonstrations, flash mobs, um, and a big deal of what we do is we write stuff. And the reason for that is because um, of the general discourse that you, that you can observe in Hungarian society and facilitated by the Hungarian government that uh, presses us basically to, to, to counter this narrative. And it's interesting to hear also in the previous panel certain, certain uh, terms like irregular migration, like uh, mass migration, like refugee crisis, uh, and so on, because these, these terms frame the way we engage with migration. So um, when we hear about, for example, irregular migration, when these people tell us about this, uh, they completely negate the fact that, for example, according to the Geneva Convention, there is a right of everybody to seek asylum, and there cannot be any irregular migration as such if they cross a border and ask for asylum. I will come to this particular point in a second when it comes to actual policies of the Hungarian state. Then the same goes with mass migration refugee crisis. If you say uh, we have, we're facing a refugee crisis in Hungary, then the, the, the policy uh, implications are very different from when you actually talk about uh, a state crisis. If you, if you talk about a refugee crisis, you're talking about how do we keep these people out, how do we securitize, uh, securitize borders and so on. If you talk about uh, a crisis of how the Hungarian and other EU governments actually deal with refugees and deal with migrations, then um, the proposals will look different. Then we have to ask the question, how can we actually make uh, 
these countries more welcoming in that sense? How can we um, live up to the standards of, uh, of, of our values, which are to be open-minded towards immigration and so on, and to give people uh, asylum that are in need of it? Um, now I want to point out one thing because it has been mentioned earlier by, I think, I don't know, uh, Orban or uh, the woman from OAN. Um, the case of the eight kilometer border law, which is a pressing matter at the moment. So, as you may know, since this year the law in Hungary has changed. People that come to the, to the border have to, um, in order to officially lodge an asylum claim, go to these transit countries. Um, transit zones, sorry. Yeah. Uh, zones uh, where today, uh, at least now, only 10 people a day are actually accepted. Um, most of these people get a negative decision. Um, so refugees try to enter Hungary through the fence. And the Hungarian government has, lodged a, has, has made a law that sa says that in these eight kilometers since the, the, the fence uh, into Hungarian territory, the police and the army can pick up migrants and just um, put them on the other side of the fence. Um, basically, these things are pushbacks into to Serbia, so people who get caught uh, do not have the option of, of issuing us an asylum um, procedure. They're basically just uh, caught and kicked to the other side of the fence, and it was, it's not really true that they get uh, a door to, uh, through the transit zones and say, here you go, please return. Um, but they actually get pushed back through the fence. And uh, to, to <coughs> show this a bit, um, uh, there was a, a report by the Human Rights Watch, I think it was this summer, that did uh, um, a couple of, of interviews with refugees that have been pushed back. And I just want to read uh, a, a statement by Akira, 26, who was pushed back. And so here the statement goes. We were tired, but if we lagged behind, they would beat us with their batons to keep us going. They took us back to where we crossed the border and made us stop about 100 meters from the fence. About 30 police were gathered. They, they were dark blue uniforms, there was also one in gray. They taught us to sit and put our hands in our, head, our head, uh, heads in our hands uh, and not lift our heads to look around. But I managed to see that they brought two big spray canisters from the cars. They started beating us with their batons while we sat and stared at the ground. Then they told us to stand up and run to the fence and they kept beating us while we were running. We came about 10 meters from the fence and saw a small hole full of razor wire and sharp edges in three layers. They brought plastic cuffs and tied our hands in front of our bodies. I was the first in line and all of a sudden a police officer came and sprayed my face. I couldn't see as he made me crawl through the razor wire, so I cut my leg and hands badly. After that I was inside the layers of the fence when he started kicking the fence to make the razor injure me. He then kept kicking my butt to, to make me crawl faster through the fence. There's an, up, an update going on. Um, my eyes were full of tears and my hands were cuffed in, uh, in front of me. They swore and laughed at me during the whole time. This is not, an, uh, this is not a singular case. This has been going on on the, on the Serbian um, Hungarian border since uh, last summer and still going on. So, uh, and the most dramatic thing, or one of the dramatic things, is that actually um, these people cannot actually access or like um, lodge a complaint against the police because they don't know who's pushing pushing them back. There are these vigilante groups at the border, uh, strolling around, arresting people without actually legal uh, background. Uh, and as you as you could see from the from the statement. Uh, people cannot identify who is police, who is army, who are these vigilante groups, because they all wear some sort of uniforms. Uh, and at the same time, the state basically completely neglects and um, and uh, basically tells that this is not happening, this, this is non-existent. This is just one way of basically, this is just one thing that is happening here in Hungary at the moment. And uh, now we'll give the word to Sam to say the other things. Uh, instead of telling you a bit more about what Mixon is doing, which is a lot of things, I want to use my um, position as also a PhD student in anthropology at CU, rather than my position as a Mixon member at the moment, to talk a bit more about what 
what these kind of politics do in Hungary. Um, recently I was sitting, and I will start with an anecdote, but recently I was sitting in a bar with a couple of friends and one friend was asking the other, do you think this state has become more present in the every lives of Hungarians or of us in Hungary? The other one said, no, how so, how could, how could you feel the state? Uh, where would you feel the state? <coughs> And the other one went on, but I have the impression that the state became much more present. And they were discussing first and back how, how to feel the state, how, how to make it tangible, what is the t tangibility of the state in everyday life. At a certain point, a Hungarian friend of ours joined the discussion and we asked him the same question. We were international, three international. And he was bursting. Uh, saying, yes, of course, of course the state did could get more present, but how? He said, it's the fear, it's the fear, everybody in this country is afraid. And we were asking him, like, can you explain what, what, what is happening, what do you mean by that? And um, what he explained to us, and what we are constantly analyzing in the work we do, um, is how the state has become ungraspable uh, due to the unpredictability of what, what will be predicted next by the government. What will be the next step? Who is going to be next? It can be a, a government critical newspaper which is closed like Net uh, Sabacha, if I pronounce it first. Yes. Uh, sorry. Um, this is just one of the many examples of where the state steps in from the back door because it has not been officially the state obviously closed that next um, but what does this fear do? What is the politics of fear? Uh, the social anthropologist Linda Green argues that fear operates and I quote as a hidden state of personal and social emergency. I still quote Fear, like pain, is overwhelm overwhelmingly present to the person experiencing it, but it may be barely perceptible to anyone else and almost defies objectification. And of course. Nevertheless, we may imagine that the prevalence of fear, <coughs> while on the one hand being a socially indivisible experience, like for example pain, <coughs> has the potential for a collective grip through public narration and projection. Uh, narration and projection of discourse and experience. The sociologist Phil Hubbard goes on to describe uh, what he calls ambient fears, uh, a kind of fear that permeates social and in individual time and space as some sort of low-level fear. This fear is intrinsically tied, tied up with the fabrication and reproduction of difference, um, difference of the self and the other and goes hand in hand with a pervading concern for every aspect of one's daily life. Taking Phil Hubbard's observations a, a step further, Sarah Ahmed, another anthropologist, contends that, I quote, fear works to affect the very boundaries between subject and other, <coughs> and furthermore, I still quote, operates as an effective economy of truth. Fear slides between signs and sticks to bodies by constituting them as its objects." And of course. The objects of fear in Hungary, then, uh, are people being treated by the insecurity constructed through an alien, alienness of an other. And in this situation, in the Hungarian situation, this other can equally be what people perceive as the state itself as well as that which the state promotes as the other, the refugee, to be feared. So there are double movements going on in how politics of fear uh, are operating in Hungary at the current moment. On one hand, the fear promoted through the portrayal of an alien threat, while at the same time, uh, becoming um, itself, like the state becoming itself a power which becomes um, the alien to be feared. 
Um, and I think this provides a basis on which we can, can discuss about what kind of strategies can we actually take because we have to um, address two different kinds of politics which work hand, hand in hand or side by side uh, in a double direction, but both, both um, strategies work to, to keep a society at large in check in a, in a, in a very cruel way. <coughs>
we, ha we can use one container in the transit zone. Uh, we keep our medications and uh, medical equipments there, basically, but the real work is happening not in the transit zone where the people are waiting to get in to submit their asylum request, as it was explained in the previous panel, but at, at the fences, uh, because that's where the need really is. Um, well, in the summer when there were really high numbers, people still found uh, the way to, to have fun or to have leisure or to, to, I mean, it was not just just a dramatic picture of suffering, but they even somehow set up a kind of volleyball uh, place to, to for themselves. But uh, still, it's a very serious humanitarian crisis situation. Today, I think, although the lady from the immigration office has left, she, I'm sure that she knows more complete numbers, but I think about 150 people are waiting all together at Rusk and Pompa, uh, which concerning the weather conditions is, is very difficult. The waiting time is uh, shorter, but to spend even two or three nights outside with children or without children is extremely hard. Um, so this is our crisis team working at the border. We have a mobile team, which is the next phase if we look at, a, so, to say so, a refugee path or route within Hungary, when they already entered and they are taken to an institution. What kind of institution? We work in two, two kinds of institution. One, I think the most important for us, called children's home for unaccompanied minors. Um, we, they there, uh, again, pediatrician, uh, psychologists, uh, interpreters and intercultural mediators actually in cooperation with Manade, uh, and social workers. And uh, we have a much deeper client relationship with the people there than at the border. When I say it, I say because I'm a social worker and I'm looking at this uh, healthy professional point of view at our work as well. Uh, and the other place that we work at it, is Bicske, but as it has been called, it will be closed. And Vamos Sabadi and Kishkul Halasri, these are open reception centers where families are staying. What we do there, again, we have pediatricians. Uh, we have a so-called child-friendly space in Bicske. You can see our co-worker. She is uh, Palestinian, Syrian, uh, working there. And here our psychologist is doing a very serious professional job nail polishing, actually. Um, I think it's very important to have a woman um, at the child family space, not only because of the children, but women in the camp uh, assess her much more easily and can discuss problems or needs uh, much easily with, with a woman, especially if she's from the same culture and there are no language problems. Uh, our head of the mobile team, uh, he often says that we get a lot back uh, from our target group of clients or the children themselves. Um, and our doctor working in the beach cat camp, she's retired already and she does it on a voluntary basis. Um, and our last team, the integration team, and then we are getting from crisis to integration. We have three uh, uh, type of activities. One is Hungarian lesson for, uh, for young people. We do it in the Tankara Secondary School. We have actually two uh, teachers, um, and we teach about 18 pupils uh, since April. And there are challenges, like many of them, especially coming from Afghanistan, are illiterate even in their mother tongue. I mean. Being a teacher of Hungarian as a foreign language, you probably would be at on Latin alphabet and of writing and reading skills, but you have to do it totally differently. There are big challenges, but there, there are great achievements as well. Some of them were really, really fast. In the summer, we had an integrated summer camp for the children who are staying in the fourth uh, children's home and accompanied minors together with a private uh, secondary school. Okay, for Hungarians, uh, all kinds of uh, activities. Um, and a third one of which I don't have picture in the integration team, we support the largest uh, homeless, uh, homeless helping organization, which uh, is dealing with an EU funded project, 
helping um, already protected people, families and, and uh, single uh, people uh, in housing. And we support this program until now eight families have been placed in rented apartments in Budapest. And of course they are supported with very complex social work by their housing is sold. We decided to participate because we realized that since the uh, integration benefits have been absolutely cut back, people find themselves again in a humanitarian crisis situation when they receive the protected status in Hungary because they, ha they have 30 days to leave the camp and that's it, they receive nothing and they definitely become homeless. Actually, the homeless institutions are getting fulfilled with uh, protected uh, refugees in Hungary, which is a very sad thing. And uh, very final words, I would like just to uh, underline a few topics, really just, just a few words, uh, which I find as the most important challenges concerning the refugee issue from a child protection point of view. Age assessment, it happens at the border in an absolutely you know, transparent way and we are convinced that many unaccompanied minors are defined as adults and they are taken to to refugee camps where they shouldn't be, they should be in the child protection system. Uh, secondary, uh, the humanitarian issues, as I mentioned, people, families, children are, are in absolutely inhuman circumstances in institutions and outside of institutions. And the third thing I would like definitely to mention about unaccompanied minors, within that group there is an even more vulnerable group those who are under 12, and we do meet children under 12, being unaccompanied minors here, and the girls, and we definitely believe that they shouldn't be in the, in the children's home because of many reasons, but the experience is that children spend their two or three nights, smugglers are absolutely having the network there, and they leave, and we don't know where they go, what happens to them, how they pay for, how they are used, and so on and so on, and so on. These are very serious dangers. So what we are working on now, we are training now only two, but hopefully three more um, uh, foster parents who live here in Hungary. They are Hungarian citizens by now, but they are migrants themselves from Iran, and we hope that they will serve as foster parents for the most vulnerable uh, unaccompanied minors, not to let them stay in, in, in the absolutely unsuitable children's home. And I would have a lot more to say left by the time we go to the Thank you. Well, thank you all. We have a total of seven minutes left with the possibility to extend to 12. Uh, so, who? Yes, please. At this point, just ask and answer. I have a short question for Ms. Korsha um, about Ford's Children's Home. I know that Emmy is, uh, is in charge of it, and you said it is unacceptable for children. I, I have no experience with the, with the home. How many migrants are there, and in what circumstances? Is it so open that they, the smugglers can just take them out of there? What is the Just one second. We'll take a question. Thank you. I I wonder what you think about, so these are really nice efforts and including like on Saturday in the really cold weather we were demonstrating against the prison sentences and, and so these are nice efforts but we know that, that a relatively small number of us have been included. So do you, do you, how do you see chances to, to influence the, the feelings and thoughts of of the majority of the society. Of course, there are efforts for that. So upon friend, Musa is just, we are sharing a video, and I really like it that he ends his talk by saying that he trusts the society. And I think that's a good approach to sort of try to project a positive picture and make it a self-fulfilling prophecy. So, but I just wonder your views on that. <coughs> Any other questions? Well, then I have one to any of you or all of you. Um, basically, whether this, everything that happened after the refugee issue, that's not called a crisis or whatever, if that made any any impact on, on how civil society in Hungary looks at itself, 
if it's mobilized more, it should create more of a sense of efficacy or, or anything at all. Okay. So whoever wants to answer, maybe at the point. Yes, I start this quote. Um, at the moment, there are about 40 unaccompanied minors. 40. 40. Uh, at the peak last summer, at, at, at the same time, I think it has been uh, maximum 400. That was, the, that was the highest number. The real problem is fluctuation. So <clears throat> why, why these uh, circumstances are not suitable? The vast majority of the unaccompanied minors are 16 plus boys. And I think it's not necessary to explain why it's not fortunate or suitable from a child protection point of view to uh, having the same building, uh, very young children and, and elder teenagers without, without enough educators or, or people working there. Uh, and the same with girls. Uh, for me, the most shocking first experience was when we went to food that the educators working there, but also the guardians, who are the legal guardians of these children, cannot communicate with them if, if a civil organization is not coming and bringing an interpreter. I mean, how can a guardian then uh, present the interests of a child if they cannot even communicate? I mean, there are many, many things, uh, but obviously those who are under 12 should be in a family-like setting. And still, for the others, a lot of love should be improved. It is open, so they can It's open, yes, they, they, are, they are free to, to, I mean, there is some administration, and by time, by 10 p.m., I think they have to get back and so on. But uh, smugglers do have... Uh, and how big is the whole thing? How many Hungarians are there? It's a huge institution, actually. Uh, I, can't, I don't know the Hungarian numbers. It's an old castle with an old, huge park these different buildings, so now the unaccompanied minors are a film and okay. Was the question directed at us or at Andrzej? <laughs> to whom was the question? Everybody. 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 Okay, I'll start. <laughs> well, uh, from our experience, I think what we can tell is that there are some positive features, but it's like a bit like searching for a needle in a, in a bunch of, like, in a haystack. Um, so, for example, when, you ref when we can refer to the referendum campaign or the anti-referendum campaign, um, uh, it is encouraging to see that it didn't actually uh, reach the quorum, so um, mix all together with um, a bunch of other organizations uh, can try to, to advocate for a boycott of the referendum, which worked out. So there were a lot of, of, of Hungarians who actually either boycotted uh, the referendum, made invalid votes, or actually didn't even go to the to the, to the vote. That's encouraging. But on a on a general basis, I think we're confronted with um, what Sam represented, with a general culture of um, in which we have to be extremely cautious. So we receive threats. From, from 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 citizens, uh, and there is um, a flourishing right wing government media. At the same time, um, radio stations, TV stations, and online and print media are basically sold, shut down, um, or basically are in the hands of the government. So we are experiencing a lot of negative trends as well with regards to uh, how the Hungarian population views migration and how they actually deal with also organizations, <coughs> NGOs and groups of people that try to uh, advocate for a more positive view on it. Sorry, but my voice is getting even <laughs> uh, I think it's very important to, I mean, we, we talk a lot to people, and it's relatively easy to, to have a certain message 
even a very strong, straightforward message which may attract a, a vocal minority who are already our friends and our allies, and we can have these reinforcing uh, experiences. We just met a friend uh, in a coffee break who is a student of CU, and she said that she kind of stopped coming to these events because they are always the same faces telling the same stories to the same audience. Uh, but this is still very much needed because it, it gives us energy, it, it, it sort of helps us consider our message. But we also work a lot with people who are completely different from us. We work a lot with police, for instance. We just had a training for police last week on, uh, on, on intercultural communication and, and, and working with, uh, with, with, with foreign people. We work in primary schools with, uh, with a very mixed audience with, uh, with, with kids there. And actually what we learned that uh, we, we constantly have to start where these people are. So you just can't go there and start saying your message, uh, whatever it is. I mean, how you want to deconstruct the concept of integration and how uh, uh, so invigorating it is to, to open up all, all the borders and, and let people mingle and mix because they don't even understand your, your concept and your words. So it's very important to, uh, to start with the, with the problems these people uh, are facing with, are afraid of, and, and gradually build up uh, something which is which is basically about the understanding of their own situation, and that's very important. So we seldom talk about other people. Uh, we seldom talk about uh, uh, refugees, immigrants, different cultures, foreigners, the state, whatever in general. We, we very often talk about those people we are talking to their fears, their expectations, their concerns and anxieties, and this helps a lot. And of course you can only do it, I mean you can't do it in a demonstration, you can't do it in a, in a, in a front of presentation, but you can you can do it very often in, in a neighbor, <coughs> in the local communities, when you are in a training situation, when you go to a school. Now we are about to organize a community festival in actually in the block Menadic's office is, which is a block of more than 100 flats, uh, a very mixed uh, population of, uh, of the of the AIDS district, and uh, and we organize a, a small event uh, for the people there. So, so this is this is what I, I actually recommend to you, to to all of you guys. Start talking to to uh, to people who are not apparently your friends and sharing the, the same thoughts, and, and that really you can be about the messages and get get kind of uh, positive uh, um, uh, experiences uh, through that. So there is still a lot of hope out there, and so I really encourage you. Okay. Um, thank you. Uh, th this will be my concluding remarks, which are just one phrase. Uh, what, what two. One of them is that we heard a lot about community here, and we, I, I think we have to stop and think about the word itself, because this is really a moment of redefining, redefining communities, and it's, it's, it's ever so easy to, to start having this logic of us versus them in creating community, and that's something that, that we, we should be careful about. And from this, the, the second phrase is that, and I'm glad Andras Sala is back, uh, is that uh, we also noticed today that th there is a need for scientific research. After all, this conference was hosted by the Central European University. However, there is no theory that's done for nobody or that's purely objective. I guess Cox said that. This is why I was happy Andras came back. Uh, so, and we saw that instrumentalization of scientific knowledge is also uh, somewhat easy to do. Uh, so we should also be aware of that. With this, uh, thank you all for coming. Uh, the, all the details and the progress of this Jean Monnet project will be posted on a dedicated website. Uh, have a good evening and please return your visitor card. <laughs> <laughs>